Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, my name is Nadir Token and I'm an investment analyst at an asset manager called 274 Investment Managers. Um, so, where, where my interest in this report would come, we, mani we do manage a suite of Sharia compliant products, um, but obviously that would be more on, on, on the capital market side and on the investment side, so savings and investment. And, you know, in line with that, um, you, you know, we don't, we don't do any Islamic banking, um, you know, but I think given some of the trends we've been seeing unfolding globally and particularly in South Africa, you know, I think these are, these are some really important questions, um, you know, which these, which these reports raise and, you know, on the role of banks and, and, and how banks should be remunerated and, you know, on, on, on what's, the be what's the best banking model and the tra for transferring of funds um, you know, from savers to consumers or, or, or investors to consumers or investors to businessmen or investors to students. Um, what's the best mechanism for doing that and what's the most fair mechanism for doing that? So, you know, I think this kind of report, um, you know, pe piques a lot of interest because um, you, it's, it's especially if you, and I'm not going to talk too much to the, to, to the slides, but, um, you know, I think Given the, the, the socio-economic conditions we're experiencing and particularly what we're seeing in South Africa and given the increasing inequality um, you know, we're seeing emerging in the world, I think alternate sources of funding and, an, and alternate banking models are an important discussion which needs to be had um, in today's time. You know, just, just, a, just a couple of weeks ago, in fact about two weeks ago, we had um, a leading French econ economist, Thomas Piketty, in our country and uh, you know, you were talking about the, 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 the drastic consequences of, of inequality and what sort of detrimental effect that, that, that has on society. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on Islamic banking, so, but, but what I do know is that, you know, what Islamic banking is about is about a more equitable distribution of wealth or a more equitable way of transferring funds from, from, from savers to consumers or savers to, to investors in an economy. Um, you know, and it's not as punitive as what conventional banking is. And, uh, you know, I think given, g given the, the, the scope for growth we see, we see in Islamic finance, I mean, we look at some of the numbers. So, the, the, there's 26% of the global population is Muslim. Yet 1% of global banking assets are Sharia compliant banking assets. So, you know, that mismatch must, that, that mismatch must end and we, and, and, and because we see such rapid avenues for growth, um, you know, in these, in these spheres and because we see conventional banks coming under significant strain, um, you know, the conventional banks ever since the end of the global financial crisis, we obviously saw the collapse of a lot of banks and that sparked a lot of debates. Um, you know, around banking models and, 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 and how banking should be done, you know. And, and, and I think um, it's important discussions and given the scope for growth which we see in Islamic banking, this is certainly, um, you know, a, a, a topic which is of great interest um, to me personally but also to everybody in the financial world because, you know, we're seeing the uprising of the poor. We saw the Arab Spring um, we're seeing it happening in the developed world. In our own backyard, we're seeing fees must fall campaigns. Um, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing the, the, the downtrodden starting to, to, to stand up for their rights and we're seeing what kind of consequences inequality has. And, you know, given that the banking sector is at the center of the economy and is really the, the, the lubricant which greases the wheels of the economy, um, you know, it, it's, it's at obviously at the center of this debate. And for a very long period of time, you know, there's been this, this discussion about, um, you know, are banks being remunerated in the, in the right way? And, you know, I think it's these kind of reports on Islamic finance to show it as a viable alternative to what the current, um, you know, financial system proposes is exactly reports which need to be discussed in more detail. So, Uncle Hussein is telling me that I'm running over time, so I'm going to hand over to, to our guest speaker now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, basically, my presentation is on uh, a report uh, which is called Islamic Social Finance Report. Now, the basic purpose of this report is to, to take care of certain uh, gaps that exist uh, pertaining to information uh, relating to this particular sector. 
And uh, the way we understand Islamic social finance, of course, there are different ways to look at uh, the sectors that we are talking about. Uh, we are looking at precisely the zakat sector, the aqaf sector, and the not-for-profit microfinance sector, which aims to alleviate poverty. That is the express uh, objective of this particular sector. And the report, uh, as I said, uh, is basically uh, to, to plug in the gaps that exist pertaining to information flows. There is very little information, as we know, about the zakat sector, about the awqaf sector, as they exist in um, Muslim countries and in Muslim societies uh, across the globe. Now, this is a study that basically uh, has three uh, major components. The first component, of course, takes care of, uh, takes a look at the, closer look at the region that we are talking about. And uh, a major purpose of this is to estimate the flow of funds. How much of funds that flow through the zakat uh, mechanism, through Awqaf, and also through the Islamic finance sector. And more importantly, uh, more than just generating certain statistics and data, the purpose is to look at the good practices and bad practices. And of course, to document the good practices uh, with an objective that these could be the good practices that we observe in certain regions uh, pertaining to zakat, awqaf, and not-for-profit not microfinance that could be replicated elsewhere. Now, this report is developed by the Islamic Development Bank uh, through its Islamic Research and Training Institute and uh, a team of researchers from the Islamic Research and Training Institute, or what we call uh, as IRTI, uh, they have been primarily working on this uh, project. And it uh, not only seeks to document good practices uh, at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, at the institutional levels, but it takes a, undertakes a comparative analysis of the regulatory frameworks of the enabling environment that exists in different countries. And also, uh, it is one of the, it tries to cater to uh, the requirements of uh, strategy formulation at the level of IDB. Uh, one of the key components of IDB strategy in, the, in its member countries as well as in Muslim societies uh, in non-member countries uh, is called reverse linkage, where the countries which are strong in certain aspects, let's say we have a very strong zakat sector in Sudan or in Malaysia, we try to link it up with the zakat sector in countries like where zakat sector is not so strong. For example, India, which doesn't have a, an institutional structure for zakat. So this reverse linkage strategy is basically underlies, or that is the, uh, that justifies this commitment of resources in this particular report. And we are, uh, Looking at uh, different regions, uh, one after another, we started out last year in 2014, was the first year of uh, uh, this report. Uh, for this report, we uh, looked at the countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, the seven countries in total that we uh, uh, researched on, uh, countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh in South Asia, and countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Brunei Darussalam, Singapore, in Southeast Asia. And this particular report, this version of the report is available online and at the IRTI website it is available for download. Uh, but today, my purpose is to give you, give you, provide you a brief summary of, of the key findings of the 2015 report, which focuses on Sub-Saharan Africa. And those of you who attended last year's uh, Zakat conference in Cape Town, uh, you might recall that this was one of the objectives uh, of that event was to uh, get familiar with the institutions and the regulatory framework that exists in South, you know, South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, of course, being a key player in Zakat and Okaf sector. And that was the beginning of our research exercise. And over the next uh, year or so, we have visited other countries and collected data uh, on <clears throat> about six countries 
but uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, those especially who are, which are English-speaking countries and who are major players like Sudan and Nigeria and South Africa. And uh, allow me to uh, present before you some of the key findings of that. And this is, as I said, this is a continuous project and we are just in the second year of the project. In the current year, we are planning to take a look at the Central Asian countries, including Turkey and the countries in the Balkans, and which provide, hopefully, uh, you can uh, come across those findings in the 2016 report. First, let me briefly uh, share with you the major findings relating to the car sector. These are the countries that we have considered uh, for our study. Kenya, Mauritius, Nigeria, South Africa, Sudan, and Tanzania. Now this one slide gives you a very, in, in a nutshell, the comparative picture as far as the card collection, is, the card mobilization is concerned. And we have uh, uh, also juxtaposed the findings of this year with uh, the findings of last year's report to see a better view of uh, countries across South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. We have also brought in Saudi Arabia, the figures for Saudi Arabia, which happens to be the largest collector of zakat. Uh, of course, Saudi Arabia stands out very clearly, about 4.6 billion US dollars, with just a Muslim zakat paying population, Saudi population of 20 million. Now, you can take, uh, you know, if you examine the figures, you can see that, of course, uh, other than Saudi Arabia, we find uh, Saudi Arabia stands out because it's zakat and income tax the internal revenue system as, are fully integrated. Therefore, and there is a, of course, like Malaysia and Sudan, zakat is compulsory in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So you can find a distinct, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, what distinctly stand out are the countries where zakat payment is compulsory. Uh, in our region, under focus, we find Sudan with just a population of 36, 34, 35 million. Uh, you have about uh, roughly the same zakat mobilized as in case of, for example, uh, Indonesia and Sudan. They compare, but Indonesia with a much, uh, you know, much bigger population, zakat-paying population. Perhaps the reason could be the mandatory nature of zakat, where every single zakat that is collected is documented, is accounted for. Whereas in case of zakat, perhaps zakat collected is much more than what is officially reported. What we have before us is the you know, officially reported figures. And there could be a lot more zakat that is collected. But because zakat is voluntary in nature in Indonesia, a lot of that perhaps goes unreported. But certainly we cannot, we uh, have to, uh, for the sake of authenticity of the data, we focus on what is reported as for the official agencies. Similarly, Pakistan is another example of a country where the officially reported figures, uh, they, are, you know, they, they are a gross underrepresentation of the actual amount of zakat that is collected. Uh, just about 100 million US dollar is collected by uh, the Department of Zakat, whereas anecdotal evidence and uh, newspaper reports, uh, media reports, they even estimate as the total zakat collected to be around 2 billion US dollars, uh, if you include the you know, private institutional zakat collectors. The situation is very similar to Indonesia, where you have private institutional zakat collectors who are allowed to collect zakat, and those who are more credible, they, are, they have been very successful in mobilizing zakat far more than the government agencies. Well, what we observed uh, is uh, a trend which is very clear that we found an upward trend in the mobilization of zakat in all the sample countries. Countries like Indonesia and Malaysia were observed to have experienced a steady growth in zakat mobilization. In fact, Indonesia stands out as the fastest growing uh, country in terms of zakat mobilization, uh, followed very closely by uh, Malaysia. Uh, other countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh displaced interesting variations, of course. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we found a, a major variation because these are agrarian economies. We found the zakat doesn't really grow at a very, has not been growing at a very steady fashion. There are certain uh, years in which, for example, Sudan, which is the leading zakat manager in this, uh, in this region, uh, it experienced a decline in zakat. 
in, in certain years where there was a crop failure and there was monsoon uh, failure and because of which the agriculture related zakat collected actually declined. But overall, Sudan has also been, has been experiencing about 9% growth rate if you take a longer term growth rate, which has been a fairly uh, satisfactory growth rate. Uh, in Nigeria, unfortunately, we found that notwithstanding a very huge population, and also, actually, there's a lot of myths are, uh, you know, uh, we found they, 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 uh, they, uh, they don't hold good if you look at the Nigerian scenario. We always believed, or sort of believed that if you have a very strong legal framework, then you can have, you know, very good zakat mobilization. We didn't find it to be true in case of Nigeria. In Nigeria, you find that every single state of the 12 uh, provinces which actually opted for Sharia, adopting Sharia as their uh, source of legislation, uh, nine of them have uh, in place uh, very good legal frameworks and uh, a state agency as a nodal agency to, to mobilize zakat and distribute zakat. Yet, the zakat collection was extremely meager just about three million for a, you know, a huge population that Nigeria has. Uh, the reason what we felt was not because there was an enabling environment, but because of a weak enforcement of the laws. The laws were there, the punishments were there. You know, if you don't pay zakat, you'll be put behind bars and so on and so forth, financial as well as physical penalty, but they were rarely enforced. A situation very similar to uh, I'm, say, I'm told Malaysia, where the zakat mobilized could be much higher than the 550 million US dollar that you have before you. Uh, because Malaysia also has very strong Sharia laws. But the Sharia laws are hardly, uh, you know, uh, hardly implemented in practice. Uh, in Malaysia, we have the state Islamic religious councils, very similar to Nigeria, you have the state boards, which take care of the zakat management. Uh, but the, if you talk to the Islamic Religious Council officials, they will tell you that we never try to enforce as far as the, uh, you know, the uh, punishments are concerned, as far as uh, taking the people to task uh, for non-payment of zakat is concerned. What they say is we tr basically work through positive incentives. And Malaysia has very good positive incentives. And that is what is reflected in the figures that you have as one of the very fast-growing countries in terms of zakat collection. They are very positive incentives in, in, the, in the sense that every single ringgit that you pay as zakat, you get full tax deduction, tax rebate on that. That means your tax liability goes down by one ringgit. Whereas in case of uh, Indonesia has been, I think there has been a lot of voice about making and bringing in tax rebate into legislation. But I guess the, the reason why it is not there is because when you allow private institutional uh, players to collect zakat, then the, uh, that could be a very perceptible impact on the state internal revenues that you collect through zakat because it goes out of your control. Whereas if it is mandated by state, like in Malaysia, like in Sudan, and this positive incentive works uh, wonders. Sudan also, uh, initially there was some uh, you know, confusion about the implication of their tax laws uh, one section of the Sudanese law, in fact, I have uh, talked about that in the report uh, very clearly. You, you will see the confusion. And uh, uh, according to one presentation that was made in last year's conference, uh, the chairman of the Zakat uh, uh, chamber, he admitted that because of that confusion, initially they experienced a steep decline in the, uh, you know, in the, in the tax collection. Because of that, they later on, as a later uh, remedy, they changed the tax laws and made it very clear that for the salaried class, if you pay one uh, Sudanese pound as tax, as zakat, then that no other you know, kind of tax that exists in Sudan, uh, you, know, uh, you get a full amount of rebate uh, on uh, any other kind of tax. It cannot be you know, double taxed. So in a sense, it clarified the position that you get full tax rebate on the zakat, almost on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, of course, in Sudan, there is a, uh, another aspect to the, to the tax laws, which says that if it is a non-salaried income, then of course it is only tax deductible, uh, similar to uh, the tax deductibility with donations made to 
you know, uh, all different forms of charity. So therefore, we could not, uh, you know, uh, if you recall, the basic purpose was to document good practices and to uh, develop some, to, 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 to see the policy implications of that and to recommend certain policies. Uh, we found that, you know, just by making zakat mandatory or, you know, voluntary, it doesn't really uh, lead to good results, good outcomes. That is, that comes out very clear, clearly from the different examples. Uh, some countries like Sudan, Malaysia, they provide supporting evidence for compulsory zakat. They have seen uh, very steady growth in the zakat collection. While in other cases, some states, uh, for example, some states in Nigeria, there is mixed evidence. Uh, where, uh, in fact, interestingly, in Nigeria, there is a, a great source of confusion on the part of the zakat payer. Uh, in four out of the nine states which have implemented zakat, zakat is voluntary. Only in five, that is mandatory. So there's a lot of issues relating to the resident status of uh, the zakat payer and whether he should claim zakat and whether, you know. Uh, and that has primarily led to the lack of enforcement of the zakat, of, of, the, uh, of the rules of punishment or the, the whole system of incentivizing zakat in a positive and in a negative way. So what we generally came to the conclusion is that irrespective of whether zakat is compulsory or voluntary, basically it's a policy of decentralization that seems to have paid off. In countries where it is voluntary, like Indonesia, and in countries where it is compulsory, like Sudan, it has paid off. And you see zakat collection really going up in a uh, in a very satisfactory way. It is the net presence of a network of healthy institutions at multiple levels, in public or in pri private domain. Whether it is public or private doesn't matter, but it is the existence of the institutions that really makes all the difference. I guess this is the same is the story with Saudi Arabia. You have a very large number, a very big network of zakat institutions which are engaged in zakat collection. And because of that really has paid off and use find the zakat sector to be a growing sector and a vibrant sector. Now the issue of sustainability of zakat, is a very critical, very crucial issue because if you, t if you talk to a conventional microphone, I'm just trying to give you the right context, why we thought of this as a very uh, key policy uh, variable. If you talk to a uh, conventional microfinance uh, practitioner, he will tell you and you'll try to sell him the idea of using zakat as a funding mechanism for microfinance. His main reservation is regarding sustainability. And the key uh, reason why many of the conventional microfinance uh, players are now seen to have experiencing a mission drift. Initially, they started out all out for poverty alleviation. And they were funded with, uh, you know, uh, donor money, most, many of them, when they started out. But over the years, they realized that the donation that they receive is not a sustainable m mechanism of funding because they are one time and they come in, you know, uh, they don't come when they, you need them the most. So this idea slowly gave in to the idea of uh, for-profit microfinance. And now we have a plethora of institutions, we have the whole microfinance industry, which says, in order to be sustainable, you need to charge profits. And then it doesn't uh, sort of, uh, it also advocates the idea of no ceiling on the prices. Again, that is a, an outdated idea, which uh, people feel it has no place in the current economy, that you can't put a ceiling on the interest rates or the price of the capital that you charge. Therefore, this has led to very unhealthy practices in the conventional microfinance institutions, and some of them charge three-digit effective rates to the poorest of the poor. They, and that is rational for their existence, yet they charge such high costs. Now, this whole mission drift has come about because of the notion that donations are not sustainable. Therefore, we examine this basic idea that if you are looking at uh, you know, some countries at least, last year we were very, you know, uh, sort of very sure that yes, zakat is a sustainable, uh, because all the countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, we found they were experiencing a growth in zakat year after year. Uh, the exception we find in case of countries which are more agriculture uh, dominated, like Sudan. Uh, so uh, if zakat is more, uh, you know, in the context of 
an economy which is more business oriented and less of dependence on agriculture, then of course you can always say uh, that zakat can be seen as a sustainable source of funding. And we have very good cases. Uh, last year report, we documented the case of Akhwat, and you are going to hear more about it in the next session. Uh, the Akhwat model is successful, very briefly, the more, uh, to, to our mind. We did a case study of that also in our report. Because uh, the source of funding was, for the first time, Akhwat showed that this could be a sustainable idea to rely on philanthropy. You have enough of philanthropists around, if they see a good model, they're willing to contribute. And this can be a growing source of funds as you grow in your, uh, as you ex your business expands, as you increase, you expand your credit pool, you can always rely on uh, the sustainability or the growing nature of this, such philanthropic uh, motivated funds. And essentially we found that it's all a question of credibility. It boils down the credibility uh, factor, whether it is government or whether it is private network of institutions. We found those institutions in the private domain uh, which enjoy high credibility, they have never experienced any decline in their uh, you know, zakat mobilization or sadaka mobilization. They have increasingly found to be favored by the donor community, by the philanthropists uh, among the Muslims. And of course, this, the fact remains that there are geopolitical differences which affect zakat management. Uh, there is thus a great diversity in zakat management practices for, uh, from out of this uh, 12 to uh, 15 countries. We found a huge diversity in the way zakat is managed. We have, uh, you have uh, the government departments fully, you know, taking care of zakat management, not allowing any private uh, body to, 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 to play a role. We have the cases of Indonesia where uh, government has a very dominant role, yet they encourage the private institutional players to, uh, to, have a, uh, to, to, uh, to be key players in the game, and they try to provide a level playing field to all the institutional players. And we also have a case of Pakistan where you have even private individuals are allowed to collect and mobilize and manage zakat in addition to, uh, let's say, government department as also uh, the private institutional players. And we have the case of India where it's a free for all. Everyone can collect zakat and mobilize, manage zakat on his own. So you have a range of uh, you know, uh, zakat management systems. And we have to take note of the diversity. And uh, also, that leads to uh, perhaps some policy implications. And also in terms of uh, the standards, the international standards and the, you know, uh, standard setting that we aim for. For example, in the case of this agrarian economies in South, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we found uh, that uh, there is a huge a, uh, component of zakat is in the form of in-kind zakat, as distinct from cash zakat, which is collected in monetary terms. Now, just by uh, acknowledging the fact that almost 100% of zakat or 95% of zakat is collected as in the form of crops and livestock. We are actually talking about a whole new system of zakat management. We are talking about a new elements of cost of collection. We are talking about new elements of co cost of uh, distribution. And we are talking about different ideas or different uh, uh, you know, ideas as they pertain to credibility, how to generate credibility, how to, you know, uh, ensure that zakat collection and mobilization and management takes place in an efficient way. The uniqueness of in-kind zakat that we found uh, from our latest study, uh, there are many more, in fact, uh, it's, uh, we, we don't have time to really go uh, to discuss each and every of these factors, one of these factors, but some very important ones, we found that there's a huge operational cost that is involved when you're talking about in-kind zakat. Uh, also, uh, therefore, you perhaps there is a case in favor of a more liberal view uh, is called for in relation to the cap that is normally imposed on the collection expenses. Uh, from our study of South Asian, South, Southeast Asian countries and South Asian countries, of course, India is an exception. And coming from India, I uh, have a, uh, perhaps a good insight into the kind of uh, the, the fatwas that have been issued for relating to zakat collection expenses. 
Tamil zakat is allowed even up to, in some cases, 30 to 40 percent of the zakat collected. Primarily because Amil Zakat is an individual and he has to run from one muzakki to another. And in the process, and he, he makes a livelihood many times from out of this. Therefore, Fuqaha are very liberal when it comes to, you know, permitting them how much of the Zakat collected can be utilized as administrative expenses, as collection expenses. Now you go to Southeast Asia, you'll find that the Fuqaha are almost unanimous in putting a cap of one eighth, 12.5%, uh, going by the, uh, notion of eight eligible uh, uh, categories. Therefore, one category, uh, that is AML, uh, is, uh, should not be allowed to charge more than, or utilize more than one eighth of the zakat. But in Sudan, we found there was a case for charging or allowing a greater percentage of the zakat, more than the one eighth that we were uh, advocating in the context of Southeast Asia. Uh, in Sudan, uh, in fact, we talked to many of the officials who are, who collect, who are engaged in zakat administration. Uh, according to the considered view in Sudan, it is almost impossible to reduce your zakat collection expenses to one-eighth or below that. The huge amount is spent in collecting zakat. Therefore, the uh, fuqaha in Sudan, they have imposed a ceiling of 20%, one-fifth. And if you look at the zakat uh, collection data for the zakat chamber, which is uh, the central agency to collect zakat, they have been trying to keep, to peg their zakat collection expenses below 20% year after year. Initially, you know, they were running, uh, I think 10 years back, the zakat collection exp expenses were in the range of 30 to 40%, but over the years, they have steadily brought it down to, the, to below uh, 20%. For the last three years, it has been below 20%. And of course, when you zakat, uh, once it is collected, you have the transportation and storage of in-kind zakat that involves substantial cost. And that is why they, they favor a one sp on the spot distribution. In fact, many of the, uh, Nigeria also follows a very similar strategy that uh, in uh, certain regions and provinces, uh, prior announcement is made that zakat will be collected and distributed on a particular day. And on the day, the, the muzakki, the zakat payers, they assemble there, the zakat takers, they assemble there, and on the spot, zakat is collected and zakat is distributed. Therefore, there is no storage or warehousing cost that is incurred in the process. And there are certain other recommendations that we found, uh, policy recommendations for uh, countries where in-kind zakat is uh, a key part of the total zakat collection. Local participation is very important when you're talking about in-kind zakat, and often, Especially, they say that livestock is collecting zakat on livestock is very diff difficult, especially in the context of sub Saharan Africa where the livestock herds they keep moving from one region to another. Therefore, often they try to motivate uh, the herdsmen or the, their family members to become zakat collectors. You know, it's very difficult on the part of zakat officials from the zakat chamber to, to follow them and uh, to, to monitor their movements and then collect zakat. Therefore, they're, they're trying to find out innovative, their own uh, mechanisms which will work or which will enable them, them to collect zakat. This point we have just uh, discussed, incentivization of the payment. Uh, where zakat payment is compulsory and non-compliance invites penalties and punishment, almost every uh, country, Malaysia, Sudan, Nigeria, uh, five states in Nigeria where it is compulsory. There is always a case of uh, physical penalty, we find, uh, which goes with non-payment of zakat. But it is rarely uh, enforced. In none of the countries it is enforced by the zakat officials. Therefore, rather than these negative uh, incentives, what works uh, uh, is a case of uh, as in case of uh, Sudan and uh, Malaysia, uh, you have positive incentives. It's tax incentives uh, on zakat on salaries. One-to-one -one deduction is allowed in Sudan. And in Malaysia, uh, in all forms of zakat payment, it is allowed one-to-one -one tax rebate. At the same time, where zakat payment is voluntary, of course, like Indonesia, its mobilization has not been any less impressive. And we observed a case of prioritization in distribution in almost all the countries that we studied, that uh, uh, Fuqaha, they have always come up with a scheme of prioritization. The poor and the needy often, they, uh, for most of the countries, 
the, where there is a sizable incidence of poverty, uh, the poor and the needy, they account for a very large part of the total zakat collected that goes towards, that is utilized for poverty alleviation or for the poor and needy. That is the first two categories. Uh, but for other countries where the poverty, which are medium uh, income countries like Malaysia, the poor and the needy, they, uh, they get about 20% of the zakat, whereas about 40% goes for fi sabilillah, or uh, mostly the dawa related activities. You talk about Malaysia or Singapore, the story is similar. About 40% plus that, that goes for dawa activities, less than 20% goes for the poor and the needy. Whereas the countries where the poverty is very high, like in, uh, Pakistan, for example, like Bangladesh, like uh, Indonesia, a very high percentage of the zakat, that almost 80% uh, in certain cases, that goes for the poor, goes to these two categories, poor and the needy. And of course, this uh, dilemma continues in most of the countries, al always a reason for debate and discussion. Uh, zakat for consumption or for productive purposes. Uh, again, there is a priority here that ulama often uh, recommend that consumption is immediate re relief and rehabilitation. Of course, should get prioritization. But beyond that, you should think of economic empowerment, which are, which are going to give you yield you results in a more longer term. Supporting infrastructure is a major uh, constraint for the growth of, uh, for the strengthening of the zakat center, zakat sector and also the okaf sector in sub-Saharan Africa. Unlike uh, Southeast Asia, for example, we have, we documented the cases of many, uh, several universities which are offering postgraduate programs in, you know, zakat management, full-time training programs. For example, in Indonesia, we have uh, the IMZ, uh, Indonesia Magnificent Zakat. Uh, we documented a case of a very good Amil Zakat training program. Uh, similarly, uh, we found uh, many mesmer level or intermediate level associations and networks in Southeast Asia in particular, uh, in different sectors, catering to, for example, Islamic financial cooperative sectors, for Islamic microfinance in general, for uh, Zakat sectors, for uh, Akaf sectors. We have uh, many networks working for uh, in, uh, engaged in very different types of supportive work, for example, advocacy or uh, uh, training and uh, all other su supporting services. Whereas in case in South Sub-Saharan Africa, there is something that is very conspicuous by its absence. You have almost no supporting infrastructure, very little training opportunities for the Zakat uh, and Okaf officials. And as a result, public awareness about zakat obligations is extremely low in many parts of the region. Now this is all about, these are the major findings of zakat. Then very quickly, uh, let me move to waqf sector. And uh, in this case, we found the uh, very good uh, zakat law, sorry, okaf laws existing in Sudan. Sudan has been very proactive in changing its okaf laws. Uh, this is almost a third version that we could lay our hands on for our analysis. Nigeria is, has also uh, enacted its zakat and waqf laws. The law, in one enactment, they have dealt with both zakat and okaf. And okaf is almost uh, uh, seen as a kind of, uh, a, uh, assuming a supplementary or a secondary role to zakat in Nigeria, uh, where you have very almost uh, less than 10% of the enactment is dedicated to okaf related provisions. Basically, the approach in Nigeria has been to create a battle mall or a fund uh, by the state agency, uh, collecting zakat and also cash for, uh, but there is very little in the law, in the legal framework that really deals with a variety of issues relating to the Okaf, uh, preservation and development of Okaf. Uh, we found good cases of uh, zakat laws, uh, sorry, Okaf laws in Zanzibar. Uh, we found a very good uh, Okaf law in Mauritius and of course Sudan. These three uh, really stood out as good cases of waqf dedicated laws where they deal with a variety of provisions and there are many firsts in that sense. Uh, certain things which are not there in the waqf laws elsewhere but we found them existing in sub-Saharan uh, African countries like Mauritius, Sudan and Zanzibar. But then of course there are certain negatives also. For example, uh, uh, as a policy, uh, uh, as a policy, uh, requirement, 
we believe that legal requirements should not make it difficult. Creation of new waqf. Certain laws deliberately make it very difficult for a variety of reasons, many of which are political in nature. I, I don't want to deal with that uh, in this uh, presentation. Malaysia, for example, there is this dichotomy between the sultans and the existing the, the government. All the religious uh, matters are, they lie within the domain of the sultan. And the sultan is supposed to have the last word in all religious matters, including zakat and waqf, and that is to be administered through the state Islamic religious councils, or Muslim majlis, as they call it. Now, in this case, uh, Malaysian waqf law has a very peculiar provision that you cannot create waqf without the explicit permission of the sultan, which is, of course, very difficult in, in, real, in practice. If you want to have a social work, if you want to uh, you know, create a work with a very clear so social purpose, then you cannot do it unless you obtain a specific permission, official permission right directly from the Sultan. In Zanzibar, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we found that if you want to establish a masjid, you cannot do it without the explicit permission of the authorities, which could be time consuming, which could be cumbersome, and so on and so forth. What we argue for is that, yes, work should requires, you know, needs to be documented. Waf creation should be made simple. For example, in Indonesia is a very good example of, uh, you know, work flow that has made creation of work very simple. And uh, very proactive work flow, if you want to see uh, very modern in its approach and outlook. And most of the concerns that we highlight here are actually, uh, you know, uh, addressed uh, in some way or other in the Indonesian work flow, because there is also a very recent law and, uh, and Sudanese law also has some very positives that I'll uh, quickly talk about. Okay, so basically the point that we try to make here is that your laws should not only talk about real estate, but it should explicitly talk about other forms of uh, you know, assets which could be endowed. And uh, the recent ones, the recent uh, uh, versions of the law, for example in Sudan, and Indonesia, these are the only two examples that we came across, which actually talk about different kinds of, uh, you know, assets very explicitly, very explicitly about cash waqf, and very, very explicitly about rights as the object of the waqf. This is again uh, a very, uh, you know, major policy concern for the observer of the waqf sector. Uh, if you look at the history of waqf, most of the countries, they have abolished family waqf over the years, over almost, uh, you'll find the abolition taking place over centuries. But for a variety of reasons, again, most of these are political reasons. They didn't want the family waqf to be, you know, to grow in stature and uh, sometimes to take on the government for its wrongdoings or whatever. So family, the institution of family waqf has been systematically destroyed. And if you, Talk to any concerned observer of the work sector, he will tell you that this must be revived. And the only two laws that we found make explicit mention of the family work is the Mauritius law and the Sudanese law. The fact remains that if you don't provide a legal framework for family work, then you cannot expect the institution to grow and to get stronger. Eventually, it is likely to meet its uh, eventual death. That has happened in many countries. For example, we have a very, uh, you know, huge body of law, work law in India, which has experienced a, a, almost a dozen, you know, reforms and changes and so on and so forth over the last two centuries. But you find that over the years, the slowly and steadily they have taken our family work out of the purview of the work laws. And now family work as a work is not recognized. You can do it if you want but you don't get any legal protection or law doesn't recognize a family work as a work. Whereas in case of the, the silver line, we, found, we observed uh, there is a cause for optimism. If you look at the Sudanese law, where there have been, there have been uh, very good documented cases of family work. And in fact, we have documented in, the, in this report five excellent cases of uh, family work. Uh, with the help of a researcher, Dr. Majda Ismail, who was here for the last WAF conference also. And she helped us document this family WAF, uh, uh, you know, uh, cases. Uh, and the law also provides a very clear, uh, you know, cover to family WAF 
in Sudan and also in Mauritius. In Mauritius, there is an interesting provision that you can also restrict. You can very explicitly provide for this and that you can restrict the benefits to one or two generations because that is one of the uh, factors that according to some observers might have played a role in, uh, in giving a reason to the rulers to do away with this wealth. Because after a few generations, the family members, the, the, the object of the work becomes too fragmented. And the benefits flowing out of this you know, fragmented okaf become so small that it, is, it fails to meet the objectives of the original endeavor, original donor. Therefore, uh, uh, this is some scholars, they have advocated this, that you should restrict the benefits to the, let's say, two or three generations. And you can make an explicit provision of that according to Mauritius workflow. There is no other law to the best of my knowledge which takes care of the family work in such an explicit way. Recovery and protection of lost work. Of course, this is a concern for most of us, especially in countries like India, where almost they say almost half the state of Delhi is work flow. And most of the government offices, they are actually, you know, uh, they have encroached work property. And it is hard to even imagine that someday they will be evicted from these properties and these properties, properties will come back to their, uh, to, to, uh, they can be utilized for the benefit of the community. Therefore, in the latest, latest version of the Indian work flow, 2013, what they have realizing this practical difficulty, what they have added there, an additional provision that if there are government offices and which have, which have been there for a long time, then at least uh, you know they should not. We should not talk to talk about evicting them, but we should talk about asking them to pay the market rate you know rentals. So they may continue to sort of uh, possess those properties, but they must pay market rentals. And again, that is a law which is yet to be implemented. But at least the community is as if the sigh of relief that at least there is a provision. There is some hope that some you know, market rentals, some benefits will come out of these work properties. And also this, there is an urgent need for preparing an accurate inventory of work facets. Some countries like India, Indonesia, they are actively engaged in this and achieved a great degree of success also in developing computerized databases of the work properties. The challenge is huge and there are certainly there are loopholes and uh, pitfalls but then it is better than not having any inventory at all. And old laws, if they fail to ensure protection, as I just cited the example of the latest version of the Indian law, the new provisions, at least, uh, they, they require the owner or the, or the, uh, the party which is, uh, which, which is uh, having these assets, work assets to pay rentals at the market rates. Now there's a growing realization that our workflows uh, have become obsolete. Unless uh, there are exceptions like Indonesia and Sudan where there, there, there is a proactive move to reform them and come up with newer versions of law uh, as a result, as an outcome of public deliberation and you know, continuous debate and discussion. In most other countries you find the laws as they exist like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, uh, India till very recently. The laws, they pertain to, let's say, the 70s, 80s, or even prior to that, 60s. And most of these laws, they have this, they are highly focused on preservation. And there is no talk about the word development. If you search using uh, you know, Google search or anything in these laws, you'll find that there are just a handful of laws that include this very term development. Basically, it talks about, of course, the basic principle of uh, waqf, that is, uh, once a waqf, always a waqf. So therefore, any kind of a you know, sale, mortgage, or any kind of, uh, of course, that is prohibited. That should be prohibited. That must be prohibited. But then developmental work, you have to find ways how to develop the same property. So what we find that, uh, especially uh, considering the Singapore case, where a small change in the law which basically relaxed the uh, provision of, uh, 
uh, giving rent a work property for earlier only, it was allowed only for three years. And in certain laws like, uh, uh, yeah, like Zanzibar, for example, it was, uh, it is one to five years. So if it is a work property, you cannot lease it out for more than five years. Five years is also an exception. Normal is one year. India, we had this provision till 2013 that it, the maximum lease period is three years. Now it has been extended over 30 years. Now all these, these have seemed to have taken uh, sort of uh, inspiration from the Singapore's successful WAF development cases. One change in their law, which now enables the state, uh, discreted by state, but basically it is community owned, the Majlis Ugama Singapore, uh, Islam Singapore, or MUIS, uh, which is basically interested with all the religious uh, affairs of the Muslims in Singapore. They succeeded in uh, getting a fatwa from their mufti or convincing them that let us relax this lease period to 99 years. And that one relaxation has led to s such a growth in the development of work properties. The case studies very clearly highlight the increase in the income that is coming out of such work properties and uh, very clearly documenting the benefits eventually going to the beneficiaries which were originally uh, uh, you know, prescribed by the endeavor or the waqif, but creating a lot of additional benefits with which you can you know, carry on your dawa activities or expand your dawa activities. Therefore, uh, basically the policy implication uh, from all these experiments, all these cases, all these country studies, is to strike a balance between the concerns of preservation and the concerns of development. You cannot talk only about preservation because in a way, development is also a way of preservation. Unless you develop the work properties, unless you maintain them properly and seek to enhance their income, the benefits, sooner or later they will become obsolete and they will seize whatever income you're getting now due to inflationary impact and various other impact or wear and tear and lack of sufficient incentive on the part of the mutawalli to look after them. All these factors will together will ensure that the work property ceases to become a productive property, ceases to, be, to generate any productive income for uh, use by the community. Yeah, this is what we found in uh, the last point in Sudanese law, which allows Estebdal as a general, uh, you know, uh, as an exception to the general rule of inalienability, if it is deemed to be in public interest, such exchange would however require prior permission of the regulator, it's not a free for all to develop work property. Of course, you need to have the checks and balances there. So prior uh, permission of the regulator with additional conditions that the same is necessary or beneficial for the waqf, consistent with the objectives of the endeavor or the waqf, and also against another asset of equal or higher value and with due respect to the inalienability of the religious waqf. Religious waqf, of course, of course you know, uh, it is not to be uh, istibdal, subject of istibdal. Public versus private domain for waqf. Again, the history of waqf tells you the story that it has been a move away from private and voluntary sector in the, into the hands of the government. So much so that in Malaysia, you need a permission of the government to create a new waqf. And there is no private party, uh, no voluntary sector is allowed to have a role in the waqf sector. Of course, this is detrimental to the very uh, institution of waqf, or this is contrary to the very rationale of the institution of waqf as it was originally envisaged. So it is originally and always meant to be in the voluntary sector with the management of waqf entrusted to the private parties. This is the original scheme of things. However, the history has also taught us a few, many lessons that uh, a state can come in and play a role if you find that uh, there are too many cases of corrupt mutawallis or uh, rampant corruption is going on uh, at the uh, mutawallis end. Therefore, you need the right laws, you need the right regulators without the absolute powers that we have seen in some cases. But then as a regulator and a facilitator, which can lead to uh, greater preservation and development of OCAF. And of course, incentivizing the work management, certain laws like the Indonesian law, 
Sudanese laws, these are two laws which very clearly stipulate what will be the remuneration that is to be paid to the Mutawilli. Put a ceiling of 10% out of the income of the Waqf asset. So the transparency that goes with it clarifies many issues. And now the Mutawilli, if he's taking more than what is prescribed by the law, of course he's subject to punishment, physical, financial, and so on and so forth. Therefore, you need a laws that address current issues for the benefit of communities that exist now. So with that, I come to the end of my presentation. And if you have any questions, and you're most welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, I noticed some very interesting statistics for sub-Saharan Africa with the income uh, generation models. I'd just like to know if there's also comparative studies on the distribution models and how much do they distribute? I mean, we've had excellent discussions yesterday and we were talking about having to spend your zakat within one calendar year and so on. I mean, it's the primary objective of zakat is to give it out to the beneficiaries. And is there statistics around the distribution as well? <clears throat> yes, of course, we have dealt with the distribution issues also in equally, uh, you know, uh, extensive way. And for, uh, in fact, uh, I didn't include the country-specific statistics in my presentation, but in the report you will find for Sudan and Nigeria uh, a lot of uh, relevant data. And for Sudan, actually, it is uh, you, you also get the time series of data, how the uh, you know, different uh, asnaf, how they account for the total zakat that is mobilized. And of course, the fact remains that the poor and the needy, they account for large percentage of the zakat that is mobilized. And as I just shared with you, uh, the, uh, the chamber itself uh, retains about 20%, less than 20% of that to take care of the administrative and operative expenses as Amil, in, uh, Amil Zakat. Uh, since you have uh, spoken about uh, distribution, uh, I would also li like to share with you a uh, unique experiment that is done in Sudan uh, in, the, in, in uh, poverty alleviation. Now, Sudanese scholars, they, uh, we found them to be quite uh, uh, open uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, applying the rules of uh, uh, asnaf uh, in the matter of uh, utilization. What I mean thereby is that uh, uh, they are perfectly all right uh, with a scheme of distribution where the ultimate beneficiary is the poor. They don't insist too much on the tamlik requirement, as the you know from the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. We seem to focus very much on tamlik, that the poor has to be made the owner of the you know zakat amount. And uh, in Sudan, you have a different uh, viewpoint. They see they they take a project approach to utilization of zakat funds. As long as the project is aims at poverty alleviation, it's fine. As long as the project is aiming at uh, uh, the benefit ultimately flowing the poor as a, as a group, as a community, it's okay with them. They don't strictly ensure that you know, the poor has to be made the owner of the benefit. And uh, uh, that's, that's the major, major difference. And that has also enabled them to experiment with, to come up with certain uh, new uh, ideas, uh, to experiment with certain new ideas. They came up with a, a guarantee fund in fact, for the first time, I, I observed that in the context of Islamic microfinance, somebody was talking about a guarantee fund. Now, they tied up with the Diwani Zakat, the Zakat Chamber, it tied up with 29 microfinance institutions that exist in uh, Sudan, and they created a fund. This fund was used, uh, was actually, uh, uh, it, uh, the funds were raised from the Zakat Chamber, it contributed about two-thirds of the fund. The rest came in the form of uh, contribution by the Islamic Development Bank and certain other uh, players. But again, it was all uh, you know, charity or philanthropy funds, including Zakat funds. Now these funds were used to provide, uh, to create a guarantee fund, uh, to provide a third level guarantee for any you know, non-payment or for any defaults and delinquencies in the repayment of the microfinance uh, debt. Uh, at the first level, of course, the, the, the client of course, he has to bring in a guarantor, as it happens in case of most of the you know, banking, bank loans and others. So personal guarantee is there. And prior to that, he also uh, submits the uh, you know, post-dated checks, which is the first level protection, actually. So post-dated checks means basically he's now 
routing the transaction through a bank, is bringing the bank into the picture. And second level is a personal guarantee by a friend to friends or relatives or whosoever can stand guarantee. And at the third level, which is not shared with the uh, sort of uh, with the client, that is a guarantee provided by the fund to the microfinance institutions. That should the should there be cases of genuine defaults on the part of uh, some clients of some microfinance institutions due to crop failures or you know this has to be investigated on a case by case basis, and in those cases where this is found to be genuine, then funds will this this fund will basically recompensate or compensate for the loss that is made on such bad loans. So that kind of a guarantee fund was the first they could create because they were taking a project approach to, to distribution of, to utilization of zakat. Uh, now which one is good and uh, uh, which one is superior that, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, there have also been equally good, uh, well-documented experiments which say that if you make the owner, the make the poor the owner of the fund, that is the best strategy to, 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 for distribution. And this interesting insight actually came not from the Islamic microfinance experiments, but from conventional ones. And this has been documented, uh, this was a three-year experiment where uh, they were, uh, the donor was actually trying to compare whether conditional cash assistance works better than unconditional cash assistance. This is very similar to zakat. When we pay zakat, sometimes we also put condition that you have to utilize it in this way, only then you get the zakat. And this was a three-year uh, experiment in a Kenyan village conducted by some of the very well-known donors, international agencies, and undertaken the research was done by uh, a team from M MIT, and very careful, rigorous uh, test, they concluded, uh, only last year the conclusion they shared, that unconditional cash transfer is the best strategy which means just, just transfer the cash into the hands of the poor, and he's the best judge of his own needs, and he, is rash, he or she is rational, and he or she can put it to the best use that is, that they think is good for them. They can always prioritize their own needs. So that is the wisdom from the conventional side, which somehow matches with uh, the concerns of our fuqaha, who have, who have traditionally advocated tamlik, that you have to give it cash to the to the poor. Don't talk about big projects and you know, funds and so on and so forth, where no one knows where the funds eventually end up uh, with. And very, in fact, uh, this is also a uh, another new trend in the zakat sector. Let me share with you. Uh, there is a clamor for international development agencies now. They want zakat to be channelized for uh, you know international for uh, helping the refugees. Many of them happen to be Muslims. And it is a United Nations sponsored uh, initiative, which now sees zakat as a potential source of funding, relief and rehabilitation of this. Now the key concern expressed by the Islamic organizations here is, uh, is about the expenses and the lack of transparency. Because the international develop development agencies normally they charge a huge percentage uh, to the administrative and operational uh, work. That is something which is clearly not acceptable to our FOCA. You cannot charge 40%, you know, just for administrative expenses. And similarly, you have to be very clear, transparent about where the benefit is, who is getting the benefit. Therefore, unconditional, un unconditional cash transfers uh, seem to be the preferred uh, way of uh, distributing, you know, zakat or zakat uh, type charity. Uh, if you go by the present, uh, you know, academic, the word that is coming out of the, you know, academic uh, circles, this is the best way. If I may just amplify on this notion of unconditional transfer. I did an experiment about seven years ago. A friend of mine asked me to distribute zakat in Lilla on his behalf. Uh, I obviously made the condition it will be at my discretion completely. And he requested that the zakat be disposed of immediately. So I took the zakat and I, excuse the crude example, I flushed it. And it was dispensed of. I took the lila money and I loaned it to people that were in need. Without any conditions, without any interest. Just repay 
is and when you are able to. Seven years later, eight years later, if you add up the number of people that were assisted, was about seven or eight. The amount that would have been required to assist them at the various stages had the amount been dispensed with adds up to almost about 700,000 rand from that 80,000. So that gives you a practical example of what can be done. And basically, it stems from the Karda Hasana concept. Absolutely. We need to integrate these concepts within our development structures. Thank you. Exactly. I, I, I cannot agree more with uh, what you just suggested. In fact, the next presentation uh, on Akhwat is a, a live example of uh, perhaps on a larger scale now of what you just suggested, creating a credit pool out of zakat. And uh, you can leverage that you know, small amount of zakat money for benefiting a many more beneficiaries. That is the you know, lending methodology of Akhwat uh, as well. And uh, they have uh, uh, such an impressive history uh, till now that the government of Pakistan has decide, you know, decided to really uh, to entrust in a way to delegate the zakat management uh, activity to this particular organization, which is a private organization. And uh, because of the, uh, I think the key variable here is the credibility, that if you do things in the right way, and of course, uh, I was told uh, that Akhwat also faced some uh, you know, challenges initially, criticisms by the, um, sometimes from the ulama, who don't see that you know, zakat can be given as a loan. Uh, but uh, if I rec rec remember correctly, the line of argument uh, pushed forward by uh, Akhwat was, that here there is no lender as such, no individual is lending, the, and the muzaki is certainly not lending. The muzaki has given his, has done his job by giving zakat, and in the process you have created a uh, credit pool, and you are leveraging that money to sort of the organization, which is a collective entity uh, with an interest of all the poor and uh, you know have a shared interest, and that is leveraging the amount of zakat and sadaqa that is collected for much greater benefit. Thanks so much for, for, for the insight and, and for, all, for your presentation. Um, maybe, just a, maybe just one initial question from my side. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot being written these days about inequality in the world. So if you look at the Oxfam report that was released last year, they say that 1% um, you know, of the world's population is going to control 50% of the world's wealth. Now, you know, there's obviously... A number of economists who have come out and, and spoken about that, Piketty has probably championed that cause. And um, what he proposes essentially is, is a wealth tax amounts to something that seems to be very, very similar to zakat. Um, in, in, in your experience and, and, and from the data that's in your experience and from the data that's available to you, um, would you say that there's a very strong correlation between a reduction in inequality in societies where zakat is compulsory. So you mentioned a couple of the likes of Malaysia, certain states in Nigeria. Um, you know, is, is, there, is there a definitive correlation between a reduction in, in inequality and, you know, we can, we, we can go on about the harms of inequality and its hampering of, on, on growth, its eroding of, uh, you know, social, the social fabric of society, um, you know, the, the destabilizing effect that it has. In fact, we saw students just the other day in South Africa storming parliament and, you know, there's a lot of schools of thought that the poor are angry, you know, and, and, and the fees must fall campaign is just something that they could unite behind. But, you know, that's a discussion for another time. In, in what you've come, or in the data you've come across, is there a direct correlation between a reduction in inequality and, and, and you know, where zakah is being facilitated, you know, the most effectively? Yeah, the, the question you have raised is a very valid one, and I am sure that uh, should be taken up this research as a research question that uh, what's the impact of uh, the zakat distribution on uh, the beneficiaries uh, at a macro level. Now talking about anecdotal evidence, we have sufficient anecdotal evidence going by the, you know, uh, the experience of certain institutions. Uh, 
we have documented the cases of, for example, the Indonesian NGO Dompet Dwafa Republika, uh, whose economic empowerment programs funded primarily through Zakat has made a big difference to the lives of uh, the poor in many villages, in dozens of villages actually, they go, uh, they have uh, this program called Masharakat Mandiri, or Economic Empowerment of the Poor. So if you talk about, uh, you know, and we have the case of Akhwat as well, we have sufficient, a lot of anecdotal evidence. But what is required is the robust research evidence. That's what, uh, I hope you are referring to that. We have, uh, we don't, still don't have uh, a solid literature uh, or uh, a large, sufficiently large number of impact studies on the impact on the poor of, uh, at a macro level. Uh, if, it, uh, if you're talking about uh, the potential, certainly uh, there's a lot of uh, good studies have been done in terms of the potential of Zakat and Waqf for elevating poverty at a macro level. Uh, in fact, one study done by uh, my co-researcher, Dr. Asim Shirazi, uh, and which was subsequently replica replicated in another, by another uh, group of World Bank uh, researchers, almost using the same methodology, they uh, look at the potential of zakat using uh, three different methods of calculating zakat according to the different schools. And they also calculate using World Bank uh, indices, what is the quantum of resources, fi financial resources, that will be required for each one of these countries. Uh, for World Bank, it is a much larger member countries. For IDB, we have the 56 member countries. What is the total quantum of resources that is required, funding requirement, for lifting each and every citizen who is below poverty line to above poverty line? So that they estimate, and then they go on to estimate the zakat potential, uh, taking the country's total you know, physical assets and uh, incomes and so on and so forth, various economic aggregates. They find that in most of the countries, uh, rather almost all of them, the zakat alone itself, if you are looking at, uh, let's say, the more uh, conservative approach to zakat calculation, then it will take care of, more than take care of the funding requirements. But it's another matter how these funds are actually spent. But as an aggregate, you find that this is more than enough to take care of. And uh, interestingly, the same study was done, uh, was uh, extended to include the uh, non-Muslim countries, and uh, where a uh, hypothetical religious, ta uh, hypothetical tax, a social tax of 2.5% they imposed, and then they found that, you know, this can take care of the poverty uh, problem in those countries as well. And that was uh, uh, quoted in, in one of the United Nations summit uh, held uh, last month, uh, where they were looking at the potential of zakat, and there was another interesting observation of a finding that was shared in that summit that uh, just about, uh, you know, 4% uh, of the zakat potential is good enough to take care of the United Nations funding requirements, whatever they need for carrying on their different activities. But it's another matter how you, how you bridge the gap between the potential and the actual. For that, you need the, to strengthen the sector, you need the institutional framework, you need... Uh, a lot of things, actually. I, th I think we need to get you in front of Minister Davies and his tax commission inquiry that he's launching for South Africa. <laughs> um, oh, there's a question there, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Abedullah. Thank you so much for a very concise and clear presentation. Thank you. I came today to really understand a little bit more about the microfinance side. Uh, I know yesterday it was much more about the zakah. But uh, from my, what I really would like to understand a little bit more, you indicated that it is acceptable through the fuqaha and ulama that the zakah fund charges a certain percentage for yeah. their costs, 20%, 30%. I'm not really saying it's, I'm you know, saying anything about that. My question is specific is to the microfinance. And today I thought there'll be a bit more of an argument how a microfinance can be free of charge or not to charge anything. And, and how do we sort of balance the two? You're saying it's okay for Zakat to charge costs, but it's not okay for microfinance to charge costs. How do we actually, if, if you are a microfinance um, operation, 
or a fund, how do you sort of you purport to actually co cover your costs uh, and make it still um, equitable when you're lending your money to the poorest of the poor and keep it going and become a sustainable fund and model? How do I find information about this, please? Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> affordability is certainly a very key issue as far as microfinance is concerned. And the value that Islamic microfinance brings to the table is precisely this, to make microfinance affordable to the poorest of the poor. And this is sought to be done in Islamic microfinance by integrating philanthropy with the conventional for-profit microfinance modes. Or this could be not-for-profit modes as well. Qardi Hazana is a not-for-profit mode. But you can use also Murabaha for that matter, or Salam, for example. These are for-profit modes. And, but the price that you charge on these products, it doesn't have to be comparable to the so-called microfinance industry prices. This could be something that you think is affordable, that the poor can actually pay. And that depending on the group that you are targeting, the kind of economic activities that they are engaged in, you can always have an idea of the kind of profits that they could generate. And this uh, has to be done in a very, uh, I, should, I would say, not in the manner that the conventional microfinance practitioners like to do. They calculate the per day, for example, I borrow $1 in the morning and repay 1.5 in the evening, then I have a 50% profit per day. That translates to you know, 50 into 365 annualized, and that can really justify any you know, lending operation, even if you're charging 500% interest rate. But then certain uh, activities, economic activities, they do generate profits. And it, these certainly are, uh, they open the way for profitable Islamic microfinance. But that is when the target client has reached that kind of economic maturity, or his business is mature enough, enough where risks are understood, where the revenue model is, uh, uh, is mature and known. And in such cases, you can bring in the for-profit uh, modes of Islamic microfinance. It could be Salam if you're looking at a farmer. If it could be output sharing. Uh, again, for the farming community who have been engaged in farming uh, year after year. But let's say these are smallholder farmers. They don't have, they don't, these are landless farmers. What one microfinance institution in Pakistan has done, they basically take it, they uh, uh, execute a master salam agreement, uh, under which they give, the, they buy, uh, they take large chunks of land on lease from the landowners, and then sublease those lands to the smallholder farmers. And the farmers are not supposed to pay rentals in cash. They're supposed to pay rentals only post-harvest in terms of the produce. That is the first component of, uh, I would say, revenue for the microfinance institution. The second component comes from financing, which is done using the Salah mode. Salah means you pay cash in advance uh, at a certain, at a known price of the produce that is to be delivered to you post-harvest again. So basically the farmer's liabilities are all post-harvest liabilities. But he gets the land to start with, pre-cultivation financing to start with. And he has the right skill to carry on with the farming activity. Therefore, the equation now looks less, less complex or for the farmer. He has the skill, he is engaged in those activities year after year. All he needs is the support. You provide the support and then you uh, can fix the salam price and the ijara price in such a way that that is not over exploitative, that is still good enough to give you a uh, profit uh, which can sustain your operations and expand your operations. Now the organization that I'm talking about is Wasil, which started out as a women's cooperative, and then they changed the uh, organization structure. They are now an NGO, and they are, uh, they are moved from conventional microfinance to Islamic microfinance. But then we also have the case of Akhwad that you are going to listen to. I'm not going to discuss more, but that will address many of your queries, uh, many of uh, how a sustainable credit pool can be created out of, purely out of charitable contributions. 
And this can be seen as a sustainable source of funding. And from the macro statistics also we have seen, and also the case studies that we have included, you can very clearly see that those organizations, those zakat collecting organizations who have uh, who are credible, who enjoy credibility in the market, who have uh, transparent procedures, who share information on a continuous basis with the market, they have never found it difficult to raise funds. So fundraising is not a problem. To utilize those funds in a credible manner, in a transparent manner, and also to, uh, in a self-sustaining way, that is a challenge. And that's how the, some organizations have really been able to to, to, to meet those challenges. So basically it is integration of philanthropy with uh, not-for-profit or for-profit modes that can give you, uh, that can make microfinance affordable. Maybe one last question from, from my side, relate, uh, relating to, to microfinance and, and the lady's question. Practically speaking on the ground, what kind of progress are we seeing in, in, in microfinance, you know, in a, in, in a, in, in a Sharia compliant way? Let, let, let's put it that way. Because, you know, part of, the, part of the argument for why inequality is so high is because conventional banks provide capital, right? And they earn a rate of return for capital. But in many of the developed market and emerging market economies, the rate of return on the capital they provide far supersedes economic growth. So basically, you you being rewarded far too much, the, the providers of capital are being rewarded far too much, and the providers of labor or intellectual property are being rewarded far too little. And that's the reason, and, and, and that results in the providers of capital being able to enhance their capital even further or grow their wealth at a much more rapid rate than what the providers of labor or intellectual property can and inequality getting more rampant. Um, and one of the things that, that, that Sharia compliant finance and banking seeks to address is exactly that, you know, through the provision of things like mudarabas, um, you know, profit sharing agreements um, between the provider of labor or the provider of intellectual property and the provider of capital in a much more equitable manner. So. Practically speaking, you know, what kind of progress are we seeing on the ground with regards to the Sharia compliant microfinance? Thank you. That's a, uh, you know, a very uh, insightful question. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Islamic modes of intervention, you talked about Murabaha, you talked about Musharaka, uh, all these for, you know, for profit modes, we have Salam, we have uh, you know, Istasna, and so on and so forth. Now these are not necessarily, uh, I would say, non-exploitative mechanisms by definition. There can always be an element of exploitation when you are, let's say, when going for a, uh, let's say, uh, output sharing contract with a farmer. The farmer uh, I was just talking about. When you charge rentals with a farmer and you are giving pre-cultivation farming, you can always fix up the you know, rental in such a way which is far higher than the market rate if there are no other market players to compete with you. So by definition, uh, what I'm trying to drive at is by definition, Sharia compliance uh, is not equivalent to benevolence. Benevolence is something else. For example, you're talking about Wasil. You know, this is an award-winning microfinance provider. Uh, their model is certainly takes you beyond Murabaha, something new that we have brought in Ijara and also output sharing. But then to see if there is an element of exploitation or not, you have to see the sharing ratio. We have to see the Ijara rate. Similarly in Murabaha, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, in mainstream finance at least, it is well documented, mainstream Islamic finance. They say that the conventional loan costs less than the Murabaha financing or mainstream Islamic banks. And some people have extended that even to microfinance when they charge the poor. They will charge, you know, the traditional lending rate, conventional rate, plus a premium for Sharia compliance. There's the cost of being a Muslim or cost of Sharia compliance. Now that uh, aggravates the problem further. You know, we recently came across a Sharia compliant organization which was charging, uh, you know, basically they, they tried to uh, move into Islamic microfinance. From conventional microfinance, they were charging 60% effective rate of interest. 
But then because they had to operate in a Muslim dominated region, so they were thinking of getting into Qardi Hasana. Now armed with a fatwa which says that you can recover the actual cost of you know, operation from the borrower, you know, they uh, went ahead with a Qardi Hasana pilot in a certain small region where in the agreement they mentioned that you have to give back a donation of 10% flat, flat rate. You know, the agreement itself included a, uh, you know, sort of uh, clause of forced donation back. Of course, it didn't succeed and there were, you know, problems with the faqah and they had to abandon that. But basically, when we talked to them, we thought they were thinking that, you know, 60% uh, if that is the basic loan rate. If you are giving it now, if you are doing a pilot on Islamic microfinance using Murabaha, then perhaps you can charge something around 70-75% 70, 70, as a profit rate. Not many of them were thinking in terms of bringing it down to the level of the you know, affordability bar. But still there are some, like I'll cite the example of another Grameen replicator. Uh, this is the Islami Bank Bangladesh, IBBL. They started out with again a pilot called RDS, Rural Development Scheme, where they replicated the Grameen model but with a Bama Gel product, the Murabaha product. Everything was same. They replaced the product, the interest rate with the profit rate. But what really, you know, on the face of it, you can always criticize, okay, the Grameen model, everything is same, you know, nothing changes. Uh, therefore, this is another name of uh, interest rate. But what, in fact, stood out in, in the experiment was they were able to offer, use the same Grameen lending methodology, but, uh, you know, what the market would have expected them to charge more than the 40% Grameen rate. They were actually, they were able to do it at 25% effective rate. 12.5% flat rate, which turns out to be about 25% effective rate. And everything else remains same. You know, same village centers, women groups, and uh, same number of field officials, same salaries. In fact, most of their staff are ex Grameen employees. But just because they thought that, you know, uh, Grameen was charging too high a rate, which is beyond the affordability of the poor farmers, you know, they could reduce their cost, uh, you know, through a variety of ways, through CSR funds, and so on and so forth, but eventually able to do it at almost half the cost. And we have, again, I keep coming back to the Akhwat example, we have the glaring example of Akhwat. We started out with 5% service charge. When it was founded in the beginning of the century, uh, again, uh, the Indian subcontinent, we have the fatwa, the scholars, they say you can recover the actual cost of operation from the beneficiary. They calculated that the actual cost is about 6 to 7%. So to, to be on the safe side, they charge 5%. They started charging 5% as service charge. But again, over the years, they found that, you know, this 5% service charge also can be done away with. By a variety of strategies, I will not deal with all those strategies, how they brought down the cost and all that. But eventually, they are now able to offer, on a sustainable basis, funding at zero interest rate, zero profit rate. And that is an example to be replicated. Wonderful conclusion to a, a, um, a good presentation, inshallah. So the purpose of this morning, and I want to firstly apologize to you very sincerely because you are my friend that uh, to, took me on a tour to New York. <laughs> I, uh, in my rush to start the program this morning, I forgot to introduce Dr. Ubaidullah formally. So Dr. Ubaidullah, besides being a friend whom I uh, only recently met, and my first introduction to Dr. Bedula was quite accidental. So a few years ago when I was doing a, sh a small paper uh, for a course that I did, I, 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 um, the, the, the theme of my paper was on Islamic uh, modalities for financing. So I read two of the papers that he produced, and one of them was on integration of Okaf, Zakat, and microfinance. And I, probably the second day after I met him, did I remember that who, the, the person who I read about is actually the person I'm walking with. <laughs> but Dr. Bedula is um, uh, one of the senior researchers at the at IRTI, Islamic Research and Training Institute, 
a division within the Islamic Development Bank. And uh, their work largely is on uh, researching and finding practical solutions to, uh, uh, to uh, Islamic social financial sector. Uh, th that's part of the work. And the, the research that they've produced in this last uh, year, are we the second or third country? Second. Second region. Second region. So I think uh, America was first, eh? Yeah, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, okay. So, uh, in many respects, we should feel honored and privileged that uh, the findings of the research is being released only for the second time, or for the second region, rather, uh, in the world. And uh, I want to think maybe we, we just for a formality of passing it on, so you're passing it on formally to me. <laughs> It uh, includes a case study on Sanzef and Okapi as well. Okay. So the, 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 and this is for for Africa or for Sub-Saharan Africa as well? Selected countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Including South Africa? Yes. Okay. So a more detailed paper. I think there's a summarized version of this on the website and I think that's the one we may have read up to recently. The first one is available. This one is shortly available. Okay. And so this should make for interesting reading. And I want to take this opportunity of thanking uh, Dr. N and of course Iriti and IDB for including us in the study. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, all you finance guys, uh, Nadir, will be able to read and dissect this for us because it's, 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 it's not bedtime reading for me, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, dissect this for us and help us really. I think there, within the South African Muslim community, there are a lot of people with good hearts. And they just want to get down to doing the work. And sometimes in our ambition to get the work done, we don't necessarily look back to see who else has made potentially the mistakes or who else out there is pioneering something. We often think that we are first because where we are in like, you know, the southern tip of Africa, we, all, the, all the knowledge comes down to us. And so this afternoon session, is also an interesting session. And I'm just gonna give them a throw forward to the afternoon session. So the second session uh, for the two sisters here that came specifically for the uh, microfinance, the next session is on microfinance. But this afternoon session, we've afforded four social entrepreneurs or activists or NGOs an opportunity to present their ideas for scaling social, uh, for, for, for social activism. And again, it's a first, probably for South Africa, like we had yesterday, a first where uh, NGOs in an open platform are able to present the idea and open themselves up for peer critique, but also an opportunity for them to say, this is our limitations, these are our needs, let us collaborate and let us accelerate the kind of work that we need to do. And so certainly this is a good basis and a good starting point for existing NGOs and anyone else in the sector to say what's the best learnings and how do we implement it to improve the work that we want to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqq wa tawasaw bil-sabh.